Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar, Five Essentials for Process Hazard, hosted by ORS Consulting. My name is Evangelia Kumaditi. I work as a safety consultant at ORS, and I will be the moderator of today's session. The way this webinar is structured is we have the first part with the presentation, and we will continue with the Q&A session in the second part. As you can see, the Q&A function is enabled, so you can register your questions. Today, my colleague, Richard Davidson, will walk you through the presentation, and uh, my colleagues, Morten Peterson and Thomas Filkin, will follow to hold the Q&A session right afterwards. So, starting with uh, Around the Table, and I started with uh, my colleague, uh, Richard Davidson. Thank you, Evangelia. And uh, hi to everyone watching. My name is Rika Davidson, and I will be the presenter for today for the five essentials to understand a process hustle. I work for ORS as a risk and safety consultant. So my background is within process technology, and many, if not most, of my projects at ORS include safety studies, such as uh, HACCPs. Most of my work is within the Norwegian oil and gas sector, but in the later years, I've also been exposed to other sectors globally, such as offshore wind, uh, chemical industries, and data centers. I will further give the word to uh, Thomas Filking for his introduction. Hello, everyone. My name is uh, Thomas Filking. I work as a principal uh, safety consultant at ORS Consulting, where I've been the last 10 years. I have a background as a chemical engineer from the Norwegian University of Science and Technology, and I worked several years as a process engineer before starting my career as a consultant, first in Lloyd's and then now in ORS Consulting the last 10 years. In ORS Consulting, I facilitate uh, PHAs, uh, HACCPs, LOPAs, and other process HACCP studies, um, mainly within the offshore oil and gas, but also within uh, onshore chemical manufacturing. So today I will, together with my colleague, Martin Peterson, uh, hopefully be able to answer most of your HASP related questions. Good, so hi all, so my name is uh, Martin Peterson and uh, I'm the head of operations and also principal consultant in uh, ORS. Um, I've been in this company since 2012 and I'm based in uh, Oslo in, uh, in Norway. Uh, and during the last 10 years, I've been facilitating uh, variety of HACCPs, uh, mostly process HACCPs within different sectors such as oil and gas, uh, petrochemical industry and also renewables. So uh, looking forward to uh, this webinar and also the Q&A session later on. So now I'll give the word over to uh, Richard and uh, your presentation. Thank you, Morten. So the scope for this presentation is as follows. I will go through the five essentials for understanding process HACCPs structured in this presentation as the five W's. What is a process HACCP? Why conduct a HACCP? When to conduct a HACCP? Who should be present in the HACCP? And where should the HACCP be held? So the presentation will last for around 30 minutes before we move over to the Q&A session with my colleagues Morten and Thomas. So again, send in your questions uh, during, in the chat during this presentation. My colleagues will pick this up during the Q&A session. So we will start with what is a HACCP? HACCP is short for Hazard and Operability Study. A HACCP is a qualitative technique based on a combination of parameters and guidewords to produce a deviation from the design intent or intended operational mode. The HACCP is conducted in a multidiscipline workshop with participants from relevant disciplines. This is to stimulate creative thinking and imaginative examination of the design under review to ensure that various viewpoints are expressed. The workshop intends to use experience and knowledge of the workshop participants. And this is to identify risk typically related to consequences towards personnel, the environment, economy and reputation. The HACCP scope is normally planned under specific company internal guidelines and IEC 61882. And IEC is the International Electrotechnical Commission and is a worldwide organization for standardization. The standard describes the principles and approach for a HACCP study. In short, a process HACCP is a methodical examination 
of a process system and operating conditions to identify how they might deviate from the design intent. But now, before we continue, and this is important, a process HUSOP considers process-related hazards, meaning hazards that can occur due to the process design. For hazards purely related to working environment and work-related accidents, and for non-routine tasks and operations, a safety job analysis is more suitable. For hazards related to external events, such as earthquakes, dropped objects, impact from vehicle, and so forth, so forth a HACID is more suitable. And for a thorough investigation of various specific failure modes of equipment, an FMECA is more suitable. <clears throat> so the following will give a very coarse overview of how a HACID workshop is conducted. So imagining this process plant. The system under review is first divided into logic uh, subsystems, also referred to as nodes, as you can see here. Furthermore, a set of parameters and guide words are used to assist in brainstorming deviations outside the operating envelope. As an example, the parameter can be pressure and the guide word is more. The deviation is therefore more pressure. The HUSOP group then assess the node to see if there is a credible risk of more pressure than intended. If a cause for more pressure is identified as seen in the example, the consequence is defined excluding all existing safeguards. So the level of detail of the consequence, such as quantification of what pressures one might experience depend on three things. The requirements uh, from the company, the time available in the workshop, and information available. So continuing on our example, we have the consequence more pressure in the system causing buildup of pressure in vessel. Potential for overpressure above the sign and test pressure of the vessel, leading to rupture and loss of containment. Furthermore, based on the client's requirement, a risk ranking may be applied to assess if the risk is acceptable or not. So the consequence is normally described and risk ranked in case of the following is affected, such as safety to personnel, the environment, financial and cost, asset damage and company reputation. After the, con uh, the consequence is established, the group identifies and lists all safeguards that are in place to either prevent the hazardous scenario or mitigate co the consequence. Such a safeguard may be pressure safety valve on the vessel for mechanical release of pressure, high pressure alarm on vessel, operator action based on the alarm, which is a manual process intervention. So if the safeguards in place um, are deemed insufficient to cater for the event, a recommendation is raised. Uh, for example, consider a high pressure trip on the vessel to further safeguard against overpressure. This would then be an automatic process intervention. So this was a, a very high level introduction to the methodology. I don't want to dig into details here in the webinar, but if you have questions regarding what guide words to use, how to divide the, the system into nodes and when and how to apply risk ranking and residual risk ranking and how to write good recommendation, please write us in the comment section during this presentation and we will pick this up during the QA uh, session. Also, if you want to learn more or have a deeper understanding of, uh, understanding of HACCP methodology, literature is widely available. For instance, IAC 61882, uh, Hazard and Operability Studies Application Guide from 2016, HACCP Guide to Best Practice, 2nd edition, 2008, ICAM-E. HACCP and Hassan, Identifying and Assessing Process Industry Hazards, 4th edition by Trevor A. Kletz. That is highly recommendable. Guidelines for Process Hazards, Analysis, Hazard Identifications and Risk Analysis by Nigel Hyatt. And Risk Assessment, Tools, Techniques and Their Application by Lee T. Ostrom and Cheryl A. Wilhelmsen. Moving over to why conduct a HACCP? Well, a HACCP seeks to minimize the risk for a hazardous event arising due to suboptimal process system. It is an important validation tool 
to ensure that the design is robust concerning safety and operability. A design that has not been through a HACCP assessment can in worst case lead to accident and incidents. So, we conduct a HACCP to evaluate design with regards to safety and operability, ensure that the design, uh, design allows for efficient and safe operations in all relevant operational modes, avoid accidents and incidents, ensure that the application of safety barriers is such that the hazards are properly eliminated or mitigated. We also conduct a HACCP to identify deviations from related standards and project requirements and identify design improvements. In addition, a correctly executed HACCP will be a central input to LUPA, Layers of Protection Assessment, seal allocation to establish the safety integrity level, QRAs, quantitative risk assessments, performance standards, barrier management activities, and maintenance strategies. HACCPs also have financial benefits to the owner of the process by minimizing the time and money spent on potential expensive modifications to control system and safety systems by identifying these issues before commissioning. It also functions as a type of awareness training to the team Due to the nature of the method to look at the process from a new perspective, not just from the perspective of how to ensure that this system has high availability uh, and performance satisfactory, but also how can it fail? Does it pose any, uh, any, any hazards for people, the environment, our reputation as a company, financially, and what measures do we need to ensure it is performing as intended? <clears throat> so in short, a process HACCP intends to reduce hazards related to the, uh, to the processing system, identify and remove operational issues, serve as input to other important interfacing systems, and avoid expensive modifications after the system is designed. Moving over to when to conduct a HACCP. A HACCP is time consuming because it requires the participation of a team over an extended period. It is an investment of time and resources. This means that time is, is, is of the essence when performing a HACCP. A HACCP must not be too late in the project, such as recommendations and findings raised in the HACCP can lead to expensive modifications and delays in the overall project schedule. But also not too early in the project phase uh, when there is insufficient basis of design. This will lead to multiple assumptions and guessings, and normally ending up having a new HACCP at a later stage, which demands more time and resources. As a rule of thumb, the design should have been through a design review prior to the HACCP to ensure that the HACCP doesn't serve as the design review as itself. But just as important as timing, it is important to have a solid management of change process to ensure that changes arising from the HACCP are properly followed up. So as a minimum, a HACCP should be executed during detailed design, meaning when the design reaches its later stages with an almost finished design, the HACCP serves then as a milestone or a final check when the detailed design has been completed. In larger projects, HACCP can also be conducted at the initial concept stage uh, when design drawings are available to identify process design requirements. It can also be performed during the improvement phase where the project is looking for improvements to the final design before construction commences. A HACCP can also be executed during operations in case of modifications that may affect the operating envelope of the process design. Or in some cases, such as Norwegian oil and gas requirements, a re hazup for example, every five years to capture, capture lessons learned uh, from operational experience and evaluate if the design assumptions are still valid. In addition, it ensures that emergency and operating procedures are reviewed and updated as required. A HACCP can also be completed close to decommissioning to ensure the safe removal of parts of a process system or the entire system. And these are quite similar to modification HACCPs. Who 
who should be present in the HOSOP. The number of participants during a HOSOP should be minimized to a core team. This is to ensure that the session is effective and not derail into discussions. The size of the team depends on three things. You have one, the size of the scope of the HOSOP, the complexity of the process, and three, the number of interfacing uh, systems with the process system under review. But as a rule of thumb, the HOSOP team could comprise of the following. A facilitator, normally an independent person who has some knowledge of and experience of HOSOP techniques and some understanding of the industry, the process designed under review, and the hazards related to it. A scribe is normally beneficial to document the HOSOP in a worksheet. In addition, system responsible or project responsible. Process and or chemical engineer, usually responsible for the process flow diagrams and development of PNIDs. An electrical engineer, usually the engineer who was responsible for the design of the electrical system and an instrument engineer who designed and selected the control system. Operation and maintenance, preferably a person who will be in charge of the facility when it moves to commissioning and operating stages. Technical safety, who has sound knowledge of hazardous scenarios that could occur. Mechanical or design engineers who has been involved in the design and at least one member of the team must have sufficient authority to make decisions affecting the design and the operations of the facility, including those decisions involving substantial additional costs. Depending on the system under review, other specialists may be required and also vendor representatives. Moving over to where should the hustle be held? So due to the COVID pandemic, people have been working from home. As a result, online communication platforms have been highly improved to allow for efficient work while at home. For the last one and a half years, online workshops such as HOSOPs are now more common than physical meetings. And this last part of the presentation, I will take a closer look at the pros and cons of conducting workshops physically or online. Starting with physical meetings. Pros physical meeting, human interaction. A physical meeting is a social gathering with physical contacts such as handshakes. The following pros that I will list now are benefits of human interactions, such as trust. Physical meetings indulge and communicate uh, trust. Conversations normally continue during the workshop breaks and are excellent for building new relations and expanding your own network. Focus. Physical meetings allow people to focus for a longer time and take in and process much more information. We also miss, avoid misunderstandings. So actually research have identified that around 50% of our communication is through nonverbal cues. So during the HOSOP, participants watch hand movements, they follow their gestures, focus on facial express, expressions, postures and their tone of the voice. Cons for a physical meeting, cost. It can be costly to ensure all necessary participants are present in the meeting. This can include travel costs, accommodation if the workshop lasts for more than one day, refreshments and food during the workshop. The cost is of course dependent on the number of participants and their location compared to the meeting location. The second one is planning and logistics. Ensure that all participants are present in the same location can be difficult in the same period as participants may have other commitments. Traveling is time consuming and might not always go as planned, causing a delay of key participants to the HOSOP. Environmental footprint. So some environmental pollution might be expected related to traveling. However, this depends on the choice of traveling. And for example, you have CO2 neutral traveling compared to fossil fuels. Moving over to online meetings. Pros for online meetings. So as previously mentioned, a big con for physical meetings uh, is environmental footprint. 
due to the absence of traveling in online meetings, the related pollution might also be lower. But however, there is a growing concern with the pollution for related to data centers and servers. Cost effective. Again, a con for physical meeting is the related cost of traveling, accommodation and refreshments during the meeting. This can be a large cost saver for smaller companies that require prolonged workshops, hustops that might require weeks and large groups of participants. Also for online meetings, call on participants. Uh, this can be used also to ensure that the HACCP study owner uh, avoids unnecessary recommendations by calling in participants into the meeting instead of taking a recommendation. And depending on the online platform, it might have some function that will contribute to a better HACCP. Such as chat functions for participants can add additional information. They can add links to further readings and share files and asking questions. In addition, platforms such as Microsoft Teams allows for participants to raise their hand, not interrupt the ongoing discussion and wait for their turn. And some cons for online meetings. We all have multitasking and lack of focus. When participants are staring at the screen for hours on end, it is normal to start losing focus. In addition, as you're sitting on your computer, it's easy to get drawn into incoming mails or scrolling the internet. It is therefore recommended in a HACCP, online HACCP, to have frequent breaks, for example, 10 minutes every hour and shorter sessions around five hours a day only. Next one is connection quality. Participants or even the facilitator might be interrupted in the HACCP due to poor internet connection. And still, I often experience even one and a half year into the pandemic, participants with poor sound quality and uh, background noises. In addition, poor video quality can amplify the lack of human interactions as was previously discussed and consequently uh, affecting the outcome of the HACCP. The next one is communication barrier. This, can all, this again traces back to the lack of uh, human interaction. But in addition, some platforms such as Teams make us focus more on ourselves, as the platform is designed to attract as much attention uh, to our own video feed as others. And, and the last one is more exhausting. An online hustle is more energy consuming uh, for a, a workshop uh, attendee. As previously mentioned, in the pros for physical meetings, around 50% of our communication comes from non-verbal cues. We get exhausted because of the extra cognitive processing to fill in the missing 50% of the conversation that we normally get from these non-verbal cues. So that was what I had prepared for the presentation. Thank you for listening. And I hope it gave an introduction to process hustles. I also hope that you sent in questions along the way for the QA. And for those who found this presentation interesting and want to know more about the topics we talked about, you can contact me or my colleagues on LinkedIn, email, or through our webpage, orsconsulting.no. But now let's move over to the Q&A session. Back to you, Evangelia. Thank you very much for a great presentation, Richard. Very insightful. And uh, we got uh, a few questions on uh, the Q&A. So we will try to cover them now and uh, we can uh, start um, um, with uh, Thomas for, for the first question. So the first question is um, about um, is about uh, safety critical elements. Um, so the question is how we can use outputs of HAZOP for SEAL studies whenever, if we did not make a risk ranking for residual risk during HAZOP. So Thomas, if you can uh, give us your opinion. Well, it's a good question um, uh, regards to whether to actually perform risk ranking in the HAZOP itself or to whether to do it later or as part of a seal allocation study. Um, some operators, of course, have requirements that risk ranking shall be performed in the HACCP. It might be quite time consuming to do it in a large group, so normally it's actually better to do the risk ranking in a smaller group 
after the HACCP. I think the most important thing from a HACCP as input to the seal allocation is not necessarily the risk ranking, but to make sure that you describe the consequence thoroughly, uh, both with regards to impact on safety, personnel, environment, and assets, and try to align the consequence description with uh, what you have in your various categories uh, with regards to severity rating uh, as input to a seal study. And of course, also uh, ensure that the causes are thoroughly described so they can be used directly into the uh, uh, seal study. Of course, if you don't do the risk ranking directly in the HACCP, you might spend a bit more time at the beginning of the uh, uh, seal study to actually um, put these consequences from the HACCP and the causes into your uh, correct um, target mitigated event level category and so on in, in the uh, seal study. But I think, as, as I mentioned, the most important thing is actually to describe the consequences and the causes thoroughly, not necessarily to do the actual risk ranking in the HACCP itself. Thank you very much for a very thorough answer, uh, Thomas. Moving on to another question. Um, it's related, it's still related to safety critical elements. So maybe Morten can uh, reply on this uh, as to whether we can use HAZOP to develop uh, safety critical elements. Morten. Sure, uh, Emangelia, thanks for the question. Uh, so safety critical elements is something we uh, develop as part of uh, the barrier management uh, work. So it's typically um, uh, safety critical elements is uh, something which is uh, identified uh, based on uh, scenarios that could cause major accident hazards and is an input to performance standards and later on uh, follow up during design and uh, operations. So I would say that um, a HACCP is, uh, is a good tool for identification of safety critical elements, but it's not the only tool, but it could be used for identify safety critical elements from a process safety point of view. So uh, in practical terms, uh, what could be done is then to uh, use the HACCP and um, uh, identify the scenarios that is uh, potentially causing a major accident hazard and then use the um, um, tags or components uh, listed as causes and safeguards and uh, basically use them as a basis for a safety critical element. So if you have a scenario with a major accident uh, potential and um, there are specific components that could cause the scenario, these would typically uh, be input to safety critical element identification and also uh, the safeguards. So, HACCP is, uh, is a tool that could be used, but uh, the message is also then that um, uh, there are other, other tools that uh, should also be used or other methodologies that should be used in addition. So uh, over to you, Evangelia. Thank you very much, Martin. Uh, so we're getting more and more questions, so we will try to cover as many as possible. Uh, moving on, um, so a participant uh, asks us if there are any specific kind of modifications uh, in the process uh, operation that should go through the HAZOP or if it is only for some specific kind of modifications. Uh, maybe Thomas, uh, you can uh, answer this. Thank you for the question. Also a very good question. Um, basically the need for performing a HACCP or a re -HACCP of the modification is not really an equation based exercise. You need uh, a competent uh, person to actually uh, evaluate it by, on a case by case basis, uh, preferably a person with thorough knowledge about the project and the process. Uh, of course, also if you want to involve the HACCP facilitator in that evaluation. But basically um, I would say that and in general, like for like changes uh, would not require a re -HACCP. Minor changes that are related to closing out HACCP actions uh, would not require a re -HACCP. And other minor changes like adding a drain or event, uh, stuff like that would not really require a, a re -HACCP. If you see that your change might affect the um, operating conditions, for example, increase the operating pressure, uh, or if you might add causes of deviations, um, 
you might actually then argue that there might be a need for a rehazard depending on how many of these instances you have. Again, if it's, it's if it's a fairly simple change, uh, you might do a, a more um, general uh, low level in-house review. Uh, if it's a lot of these changes that add causes or change the operating parameters, uh, it's a good practice to perform a rehazard of the affected parts of the design. Thank you, Thomas. Um, so, um, maybe Morten uh, can answer if a hazard report can be reviewed from other parties as a validation process or not. Heading to you, Morten. Thank you. Um, first of all, I would say that the, the HOSOP in itself is uh, an important milestone for a project and a validation process in itself. and. Uh, so basically, it's important that um, relevant stake, uh, stakeholders and parties are involved in the, uh, in the HACCP itself uh, in order to express their opinions, concerns, and uh, to ensure that uh, HACCP as a validation tool uh, is, uh, is as good, good as, as possible. So I think that HACCP itself is an important tool in order to validate that the system is safe and uh, efficient for the operation. And of course, the outcome and results from the HACCP is also important documentation for both the project and asset um, for future validation uh, process and uh, review processes. So that's uh, the short answer, Evangelia. Thank you, Martin. Even a short answer, it was uh, <laughs> very thorough. Um, so, Thomas, uh, maybe you could uh, reply on the answer if you would normally include spectacle blinds in a HAZOP. Well, uh, normally you can have as an assumption in a HAZOP that instances where you have positive isolation, for example, removal spools or spectacle blinds, you make an inherent assumption that the operators do not uh, intentionally want to sabotage the operation. So you can safely assume that uh, moving positive isolation uh, during normal operation is not something an operator uh, wants to do, and it's not really a credible scenario in a HACCP as such. Of course, you uh, need to evaluate if there are special operating modes where these positive oscillations has to be moved and in those cases you need to uh, assess the uh, probability or the uh, uh, consequence of uh, these uh, oscillations being uh, moved in, in the wrong order or uh, inadvertently. But again, normally uh, and during normal operations uh, it's uh, fair to assume that the operators want to keep the plant, uh, they, they don't intentionally want to uh, sabotage the plant uh, if, if they do, then you have bigger problems than your process design. So um, it's, it's a normal assumption to say that positive isolation are in their normal position during normal operation. Yes. Thank you very much, uh, Thomas. Maybe actually we can uh, continue with you. Um, and uh, give us the difference between a HAZOP and a seal loop of an already operational facility. Well, I'm not really sure uh, about uh, what the question means, but uh, if you have an operating facility and you want to do a HAZOP uh, and or a seal, of the operating facility, of course, you need to take into account uh, the operational experiences with that facility. If it's a rehazard, you need to consider any near misses or incidents you had with the design, and you need to take into account the operator experience with operating the, the plant. The same goes uh, with, of course, uh, your uh, seal or your LOPA studies. Normally, these are based on, on rules of thumb, but if there are operational experience indicating that things happens much more frequently than uh, what rule of thumb says, you need to, of course, take that into account in your uh, um, LOPA or seal analysis of your operating plants. Thank you very much, uh, Thomas. Um, 
then uh, we have a question. Um, it's uh, very much of uh, the corona situation uh, since uh, Eric had mentioned in the last part uh, the pros and cons of uh, running online hazards or uh, through Teams. So we have a question that says for online hazard meetings, would you say a full working day, eight hours, uh, is good or maybe too exhausting for the participants? And uh, maybe more than uh, you can uh, give us uh, your point of view as you have experienced it. Yes, and thanks uh, for a very good and relevant uh, question. Um, and the, this is something we frequently discuss and consider. And uh, I think it's uh, in, in, it's important that the online uh, HACCP workshops are um, uh, are adjusted and uh, made so that the participants are not getting too exhausted because maintaining and keeping focus during the entire session is critical for for the outcome. Uh, so I would say it's possible to do a full working day and uh, eight hours, but if you do so, um, it's important to ensure that there are frequent breaks. Uh, so what I typically do is to have uh, breaks uh, every hour um, and also that you allow for a sufficient uh, lunch break. Um, so breaks are important because it's uh, it's quite intense to keep the focus during an uh, entire uh, session. Uh, so, but if you have the possibility to split it into a uh, session lasting for two days, for instance, uh, four or five hours uh, split on two days, I think that's a better option. Uh, but uh, it's uh, still manageable to do an online uh, workshop during one day, as long as you do uh, frequent breaks. Thanks. Yes. Thank you very much, Martin. Uh, I think there are many different opinions on uh, this one, but uh, a, an explanation uh, like this is uh, very reasonable. So people have experienced, of course, in different ways. Um, moving on to more questions. So um, this is from Jose. Uh, and uh, he has actually listed uh, maybe three or four questions uh, as far as I can see. So maybe Thomas, we can start with you and uh, maybe you could answer as to when uh, do we have uh, to do a bow analysis as part of a PSM um, within a project phase and planned uh, operating phase. So um, uh, if we can start Thomas. Well, there's no general requirement for when you have to do a bow tie analysis. Uh, bow tie analysis is, are a great tool for visualizing uh, chain events and hazards. So normally you do bow tie uh, analysis of the identified major accident hazards from your hazard or your hassle, and then you visualize the uh, chain events, the, um, the causes that have to occur and the barriers you have in place uh, to prevent this from occurring. Uh, with uh, the additional uh, risk affecting uh, factors included in that bow tie. So I guess the, 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 the short answer is that there's no real requirement for when you have to do it. Uh, of course, you do it when you have a, a high risk or a major accident hazard that you want to visualize a bit more than what you do through a hazard or a hazard. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, could you also continue to another question uh, also from Jose, um, which is uh, related to human factors actually. So Jose would like to have a, a brief explanation about the importance of human uh, factor and behavioral safety in risk identification, risk analysis and uh, risk assessment. Of course, the human factors are a very important part of it. I think just to kind of start by saying that, as Richard mentioned in the beginning of the presentation, a HACCP is not really a catch-all for everything, so you shouldn't rely on, on putting all your eggs in, in, in one basket, uh, the HACCP basket. But basically, uh, human factors are important in a HACCP because you, the operators are both or could be both uh, causes of accidents and they're also an important safeguard in regards to response to alarms and so on. So I think in a HACCP, uh, it's it's not detailed enough to say uh, 
would wear much detail about how the operators would respond and stuff, but an outcome from an ASAP is, of course, if you have uh, scenarios where you are relying on a operational procedure or if you are relying on a operator response to an alarm as a safeguard, those could be scenarios that you investigate further in uh, other kinds of workshops that look more into detail uh, on how operators respond in different situations. The same also if you have uh, hazards that are occurring due to operators needing to follow several steps in a complex procedure and so on. It's better to actually analyze that in detail in, in other workshops than the HACCP itself. Yes, thank you, Thomas. Um, moving on to a question from another uh, participant. Uh, name is Sharad. So the question is, uh, Maybe more than for you to answer. Um, is a hazard dependent on participants? Um, and if uh, there are any tools that we could make it independent of participants? Getting to you, Martin. Thank you, Sharat. Uh, An interesting question. Uh, from uh, my point of view, um, I think the strength of HACCP as a methodology is that it's multidisciplinary and that you gather uh, the different uh, disciplines in the same room or uh, digital channels uh, and that you together as a collaborative exercise you're able to identify scenarios and uh, what we see in a HACCP is that uh, uh, you can by including uh, relevant and multiple disciplines such as process instrument different stakeholders you are able to identify scenarios and evaluate scenarios uh, that is challenging for an individual or an individual um, discipline or potentially a tool uh, to identify on its own. So um, I would say then that uh, the HACCP outcome is highly depending on the uh, participants um, and uh, at least uh, to my knowledge there are no uh, tools uh, available at this stage that is uh, um, uh, replacing the need for involving uh, multiple disciplines and again I think that's the strength of the HACCP and uh, why it's a good methodology for identification and evaluation of uh, scenarios. Thanks. Thank you more than very much. Um, maybe you could stay on for uh, one more question. Um, that would be how to practically define or delimit the scope for a hazard and a hazard for the same design in order to ensure the alignment and synergies and avoid uh, duplicating uh, work. Thanks, uh, and that's a good question and uh, a question that we are um, uh, frequently facing as well. Um, and uh, how I would say it is that uh, uh, if you have a if you have a project with uh, let's say it's a process system uh, and it's a, it's a module that is going to be built, the HACCP will focus on the process safety as point of view and uh, the scenarios that could occur within the piping within the uh, within the vessels. So uh, focusing on the process part of it. And then you have the hazard, the hazard identification that will focus on the surrounding uh, hazards and the other hazards and threats, uh, such as related to uh, dropped object, um, uh, impact, uh, uh, leaks, and so on. And uh, the hazard is then focusing more on uh, the scenarios following a loss of containment uh, that you have also uh, addressed and discussed in the HACCP. So in order to avoid duplicating the work, um, I would say it's important that the HACCP is solely focusing on the process safety and not considering other aspects such as uh, active fire protection, fire and gas detector mapping, um, uh, location of leak sources and so on. But the HACCP is then addressing those uh, aspects so that you have a clear cut and uh, that the HACCID uh, is also adding value as a separate uh, activity. And uh, coming back to the question earlier on today on safety critical elements, so HACCID is another uh, useful and good methodology that could be used as a starting point for the barrier management activities and identification of uh, safety critical elements. So another good example.
Thanks. Yes, perfect. Thank you very much. Um, Thomas, maybe back to you uh, for questions. Um, I hopefully I understand it correctly. Uh, it's from Jose. And uh, the question is to differentiate the uh, functional safety, process safety, and personal safety. Um, so maybe a brief explanation about the difference be between uh, those three, Thomas, uh, from you. Sure. Well, uh, functional safety first, since that was the first part of the question. That is related to the performance requirements you put on the instrumented systems that you have uh, in place as part of your barriers to prevent a cause from becoming an accident. So, for example, if you have a process trip um, that are uh, reading high pressure and closing several valves or something, um, that's an instrumented function. And the performance requirements, including the reliability requirements you put on that, is uh, functional safety. Process safety is uh, a wider uh, topic. Functional safety, you could say, is kind of part of process safety, but process safety is related to the uh, overall technical, organizational, and operational measures that you have to take to prevent process accidents. So, as the Morton mentioned, is it's related to the um, process design, not the general design. Um, but basically, it's it's a framework that you have in place to ensure that your process design envelope is protected and that it has sufficient resilience against system failures and degradation. Personal safety, uh, on the other hand, is, uh, at least in my opinion, more related to uh, minor incidents uh, such as uh, dropped objects, uh, wearing uh, hard hats and personal protective equipment, uh, slip strips and falls and so on. Thank you, Thomas. Hope uh, that uh, gives a good explanation. Um, maybe we can uh, answer a, a question um, that has to do with the application of the hazard studies for renewable and uh, carbon capture and uh, green hydrogen technologies. This is uh, very relevant uh, both for uh, the era that we live in and uh, the trend towards uh, these uh, new technologies, uh, but also to the ORS activities. So maybe more than since you have been involved in a project like that, maybe you could uh, give us uh, your opinion. Thanks, uh, Vangelia. So uh, that's correct. Both uh, myself and also colleagues have been working uh, quite a lot also with HASA for renewable sectors and other, other applications. And uh, uh, the message from my end is that as long as you have a process uh, system with, uh, that includes um, fluids or gases that could uh, be the cause of a, a major accident hazard, it's relevant to do a HOSOP. So whether it's um, whether it's a carbon capture system or whether it's a hydrogen or whether it's uh, within pharmacy or uh, oil and gas, it's the same methodology and same kind of uh, approach, approach that you can do to uh, the process uh, safety evaluations. Um, and of course, for some industries, uh, it will be a bit different uh, scenarios, threats, hazards, causes, and so on. But the methodology will be uh, the same that you divide the system into nodes that you use a set of parameters and guidebars. Of course, you could tailor it uh, depending on the application. Um, and then basically follow the same approach as uh, Ricard uh, went through earlier on in this uh, session. So. Uh, as long as there is a system involving fluids, gases, either it's batch, uh, batch uh, systems or process, or if it's a continuous uh, production, it's uh, the HACCP is a well applicable and uh, good methodology. Over to Evangelia. Yes, thank you, Martin. Uh, that was a very nice uh, Topic, I think, very interesting. Um, we can continue. Maybe we have about ten minutes. So I see that there are more, um, let's say, more specific and uh, technical questions. So um, maybe um, Thomas, uh, you could uh, 
you could answer to this question here about what factors should be accounted for while specifying the frequency of any unwanted scenario during a hazard. So, Thomas? Well, of course, if you want to do the risk ranking in the HACCP as opposed to in the CL analysis, uh, as I was asked about in a, in a previous question, you need to, uh, first of all, uh, consider um, whether the operator or the engineering company has rule of thumbs for how often things uh, occur. Uh, in addition to that, there are general requirements from, for example, IC 61511 with regards to how reliable you can assume a control system to be that you need to adhere to. And of course, you need to take into account if there are operational experience uh, in the room or in the HACCP team uh, with operation of the uh, plant that you are HACCPing, if it's a rehazup or operation of uh, similar plants in similar environments. Um, so basically, uh, adhere to the rules of thumb if, if those are in place from the operators and engineering companies and make sure that you follow the uh, general requirements in ISIS 1511 and related standards and of course take into account the operational experience uh, in the HACCP team. Thank you Martin, hey Thomas, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Thank you Thomas. Um, this switching uh, can be confusing. So uh, Moving on to another uh, technical question, which actually more than can take. Um, this is related to the node splitting. So Richard gave um, a, a few words uh, about the methodology of a HAZOP and uh, node splitting. So here is a question for you more than, uh, would you recommend to split the system in many nodes or just a few? Thanks, and that's a good, uh, good question. And uh, it's all, always, uh, or it's often open for discussion as well. So um, it depends on the application and also the uh, stage of the project and also the level of uh, detail uh, available. Um, but the overall advice and recommendation is to have nodes that are manageable or make it uh, as a manageable discussion and that it, all the participants can follow, easily follow the discussions and also give contribution. Um, so, for instance, if you have a node where there are different or multiple scenarios, for instance, within overpressure and multiple scenarios that could cause a high temperature, then it's uh, potentially a too big node. So keep it manageable where you have a um, system with not too complex uh, process, the same process conditions um, uh, and so on. So I know that uh, different industries and companies have uh, uh, rule sets or guidance on how to do the node splits. So I will not be too specific, um, but uh, the general advice is to have it manageable. And if you have, have two small nodes, the problem is that you may uh, lose the big picture as well. So um, uh, uh, you shouldn't be tempted to split it into individual components and so on because then you will uh, lose the uh, integrated design and uh, overall uh, overall view so uh, over to evangelia you're muted uh, evangelia Apologies. So we have uh, one more uh, a technical question and um, it's about the credibility of uh, check valves uh, during a HAZOP. So I think this is something that uh, we have seen um, that we have seen in uh, various projects we have seen in barrier management. So maybe thomas uh, could you answer if we should take uh, credit uh, of non-return valve or a check valve uh, while doing a hazard sure uh, that's a question that always comes up in a design because of course you introduce the check valves to minimize or prevent reverse flow uh, but Taking credit of a check valve is not really uh, allowed or recommended uh, a single check valve. 
Um, of course, if, if you are using check valves to uh, minimize uh, reliefs through uh, uh, pressure relief devices due to backflow, you need to have two uh, check valves in uh, series and they need to be uh, independently verifiable uh, and they need to be flagged as a safety critical. But basically you can say that uh, a check valve always leaks when you don't want it to leak and it uh, doesn't leak when you actually want it to leak. So I would not say that you should take credit of a single check valve as uh, a barrier. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Thomas, for your uh, answer. And uh, I think uh, that uh, this would be the last uh, question to take from the Q&A session. Um, as we only have uh, five minutes uh, remaining, so it would be good to wrap up. Um, so, yes, summing up, um, we the, the, uh, this webinar is uh, recorded and it will be published in ORS uh, webpage, so you can find the whole session there. Um, also, uh, we will try to answer, um, we received a few emails here to answer some questions uh, after the session. So we will try to do this. Um, you can all also, uh, you have the contact information uh, from uh, all today's participants and uh, they are uh, on the Q&A function as well posted. So you can uh, try to reach them out if you have uh, any further questions or uh, discussions. Um, so yes, having said that, thank you very much for uh, joining uh, today's webinar. Uh, we hope you really enjoyed it and uh, you, find, you found some insightful input. Mm. Uh, you can find more, please follow ORS Consulting on LinkedIn so you can stay up to date um, with uh, more events, insights and uh, webinars to come. You can also subscribe to the newsletter so to get notifications about it. And uh, thank you very much for your time today. Have a nice day.